So if you educate people, you want to let them know that they, they have this uh, possibility of freedom in there? Well, you can, you can do that, but it's got to be discovered by that person. When Bob Marley say you're talking about my freedom, he's trying to tell you that nobody can make you free. You got to select that for yourself. And then you got to live by that. And that living by that means making the right choices and right decisions. You see, and nobody can give you that. Nobody can say, okay, now you're free. That's, that's part of the same corrupt system that says that you're not free. You claim your own rights of freedom, just like that, you see. If you take the Occupy movement that we had just recently, okay, a strong implication for the right directions, but a group that actually had no intentions about becoming free, no intentions about actually achieving a social level in our society that would be correct, they wanted to change power with their mothers and fathers. That's essentially what they wanted because that's why they failed, you see. And it could have been much, much simpler. It could have been far more effective, but they refused even to look at history, you see. They had a model right there in front of them. The civil rights movement is one of the most successful movements in modern times. They had no idea about that movement whatsoever because all of the parameters or the principles that they want to incorporate was a kind of rebellion against mother and father. And that won't get you a revolution. That won't change your society. That will last only a little while. And of course, that's what happened. It was a spontaneous spark that lit the whole planet. It should have been successful, but it wasn't, you know. I wonder if you have, if you have more to say about freedom? Well, the biggest thing I think I already said is that no one can give you that, you see. And the way that you acquire freedom is that you select to be free on your own choice, by your own self without asking anyone, your mother, father, sister, brother, any niece, uncle, nephew, stranger, Martian, or whoever. And once you make that decision, you live by it. Or die by it. Either way, it's the same. You see, that conviction is the same. And does, does the collective interfere with that? No, the collective doesn't interfere with it. It's just that a collective has better success at achieving its goal if it has this idea about a responsibility of leadership. Okay. And all of the old collectives that we know that exist right now, uh, they either have this responsibility of leadership with members, or they have this single individual, or this family of the individual that's running something without members. And that's, there's no other way. There's no middle ground. It's, it's these two, two bumps in the road. One of them had the potential, this one over here with the, with the responsible leadership and members that actually help. And this other one over here with the family, that's a dictatorship. That's not really a, something that we can be happy about. And it does happen a lot in our life, a lot, you know. Uh, uh, an active, engaged, living, organic, dynamic ensemble or collective is something to be happy about. See, something to be happy about. So as a leader of some different ensembles, mm -hmm. each time you propose some, some different structure and different system? 
Well, you see, like, um, uh, you have different ensembles for different kinds of projects, basically. Um, um, and these different projects will determine what kind of personnel or personnel you need for to achieve those projects. That's a different kind of an ensemble, okay? That's an ensemble based around projects. Mm -hmm. Normally, it's not a collective that meets together. It's only meet because of this project, okay? This other one here, or another type, is one where you situated where you got everybody that's connected and they're gonna be connected or have been connected kind of a around the clock, so to speak. And that, as well as that other one, they both still need this leadership thing, you see. Um, but sometimes that one, that is the one that's older and maintains itself, people use that one more often than they do this other project one. And so the project one will stay alive just because it's a project ensemble or project idea for ensemble because each project is different, so it stay alive. This one over here, we gotta work much harder to make it stay alive because at some point it becomes stale, meaning that it doesn't have the energy that it had before. And so rather than sticking it out or breaking up, the leadership change or the leadership switches or some of the people in it switches. Just to change one member in an ensemble that's already uh, fighting to get up the hill is a very important move, you see. And that new, un that new person will actually uh, create enough excitement within, let's say if it's a five piece ensemble, it create enough excitement so that things are renewed again, you see. It's like, it's like, it's like, um, uh, deciding to jump over Jupiter a second time. And this time you're gonna jump over it backwards as opposed to jumping over it sideways or forward, you see. So it, it gives a new, new energy. And every time one or two of those are changed, and if it's a five piece something, the ensemble itself is gonna keep its character, but it's gonna be new. If Three of them change in that ensemble. It won't keep its character, and also it will be new. You see. So, so yeah, those two extremes are probably the examples I would give uh, in this context. And you give to the people you work with some specific material. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, involving color. Well, it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm, if I'm working with acrosmation, then it involves color and structure and images and also commands and uh, uh, a host of uh, uh, linguistic properties to make it work, a host of them. Uh, and and uh, uh, it's, a, it's an endeavor that's completely different from the ideas that people use when they refer to graphic scores. Um, I don't do graphic scores, you know. Uh, my scores, my approximation scores are language scores. And the reason they are language scores is because they have a certain set of commands that goes along with it that determines success or failure. And um, uh, they require uh, a vast curve of learning to be able to manipulate them in a proper way. Whereas a graphic score doesn't have any commands whatsoever, usually, and it does not have a rate of success or failure. Its rate of success or failure is to start and stop. Okay, and lots of artists have had these, these journeys from John Cage straight on through to a, a bunch of other people, you see. And, uh, uh, I, I have not discovered anywhere where any of those guys thought about it as being language. 
as opposed to being a graph. You see? Um, so language, language is, is something that has preceded the idea of how to communicate. It's coming, it's coming like out of that, you see. Um, I wrote it. it comes after the idea of how to communicate. Language does, you see. And it formulates itself uh, based off of the vitality it has in it from the very beginning and the rules of change that takes place as it grows. And if it doesn't grow, it becomes just a function of something that may last or be looked at in a lot of kind of ways, but it won't really expand or continue, you see, uh, or become specialized. Like Latin, for example, is a specialized language. It's not a language that we use to, to deal with this or that anymore, you see. Or another kind, like if you look at like um, uh, 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 glyphs, glyphs, also same thing. They become a specialized language now, you see. But at one time, they were like, those two languages were like powerful means of communication. And they housed the possibilities of all these brilliant ideas and stuff. You see. Same way in terms of when you look at the idea or the difference between a graphic situation and a language situation. They, they, they differ, very different. And um, uh, when one of my uh, approximation pieces are performed, um, you can always tell, at least I can always tell the success or failure of it. Uh, based off of how well the language is spoken and how well it's used, you see. Yeah. So do you think that uh, as a leader, you're responsible for bringing a language, meaning like a specific way to communicate within an ensemble? Not really. You could do it within any language. You see, it could be just... Uh, or what do you call it, line, notes, and spaces, you see. Or it could be just dictated, you could say, do this, or something. It's still, it's still a form, it's still a notation, it's just spoken, you see. So I don't really think that it's necessary to have a Pacific language. Uh, creativity is not captured by a Pacific language. It's captured by all language, you see because the expression of that creativity is not in the language until it's expressed. You see, beforehand it's a possibility. It has possibilities. But the creative person is able to renew that language with every uses because of this intuitive and this uh, uncommon awareness of how to use it. And for example, if we step out of the ensemble and we're just like in this world uh, where like the collective is huge, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of unending collectiveness, mm -hmm. who's responsible for the communication to work? You mean in the, in the special ensemble or in the world? In the world. Well, that's, that's, that's already fixed up. I mean, how good or bad it is, is already fixed up. Uh, every society takes its general cues from their social scientists and politicians and educators and people like that, okay? Um, uh, and so for those institutions to truly work, people have to be constantly engaged, but people don't have time to be constantly engaged. And the reason they don't have time because they have jobs and they have these jobs because they want to be better, better than, than the Jones and the Bettys and the Arthurs and the Gertrudes. They want to be better. So they work these jobs to get ahead of everything. And then the other part is they want their kids to have a better opportunity than they did. Okay, well, that's like putting the horse in back of the carriage, you see. 
you make your society appropriate for your kids to be in. And the only way you can do that is by making really quality decisions and making choices that work. And if the choice is, is selected that doesn't work, having the courage to change it and go another direction. That's what's happening. Uh, that's what's important about the large part of the world. Right now, the world is captured by smart people and speaking people, not intelligent people, because you can be smart and not intelligent, but smart speaking people, smart organizing people, smart uh, manipulating people, and they stand behind those uh, barriers and they select the direction they go. You see, no, that's not the right way to do it. Simply isn't. When you say, when you say like, do something different, mm -hmm. that makes me think of that when you talked about expanding, like in this ensemble, mm -hmm. like when it mm -hmm. works, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel that it kind of means the same, but I'm not sure. Like, Well, what I mean is that um, in most societies or most part, let's take, just take America, in most, and almost throughout America, okay, it, it prides itself off of being a democracy, okay? And other countries take that same model and pride themselves that they function within a democratic society. Well, there's no democratic society on the planet at all. Never been. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about something that's real or something that's a dream? There are, there are democratic principles that have been carved out by constitutional uh, decorations or political decorations or social decorations, but they are not part of the society. They're not practical. They're not being practically, they're not become, become a practical function of the society, okay? So here in America, you have instituted parties that select to erase people off of voting records or to suppress voting rights. How contradictory is that? in regards to democracy. That's not a democracy. You cannot have a democracy like that. Or you have a society where, where, where the majority of the people that have power and wealth allow the police to do their bidding by killing people that are not like them. And then they endorse it. They endorse it with their silence in your presence, and they endorse it on these social networks by being vocal, saying that, oh, the police is right, you know, because they, they're behind a barrier. You can't see them. They don't feel any pressure. But the pressure is there. They just pretend that they don't feel it, you see. Uh, those are not democratic principles. How is it that a young kid, a young kid can leave his home or her home with no weapons in their pocket, or in their bags and be killed by someone that we call an officer that's supposed to be protecting the society. That's not a democratic guy. That's not a democratic guy, you see. So, so when we talk about democratic societies, we're talking about a, about a dream that has never been fulfilled in any society on the planet. Like utopia or something? Well, It could, we could use the word utopia, but we know for a fact that democracy has not arrived, you see. And we know for a fact that most of the people that live in societies that they call democracy, that have democracy or, or democratic governments, they also know the same thing. But they don't change it. They don't change it because they don't have the will to change it or they agree with the way in which it exists now. See? So, um, notions of how to do things, that has to be cultivated, you know? Either through this system of somebody opening the way for you, 
or through your own intuitive um, search. But it has to be done. 